Good evening, and welcome to Newtown Middle School. <clears throat> Tonight, we are proud to present the members of the Bucks County District Attorney's Office who will be sharing a presentation designed to educate the community on social media. We have District Attorney Matthew Weintraub and Detective Dante Montella with us. What is it about social media that is so compelling that it takes our attention wholly and absorbs our efforts so easily? It is safe to say that almost everyone here tonight has at least once sat at a dinner table with others who are completely engrossed on their phones. We see children as young as two years old playing with devices, thumbing through until they find the right Coco Melon video. We live in a digital age and our children are more conversant, agile, and immersed in it than we understand. Social, me social media blurs the lines between fact and opinion. Several social media sources regularly post misinformation, which can be dangerous and misleading to our community and our children. Our concern is that families may make decisions based on inaccurate information disguised as legitimate. Moreover, our children are frequently exposed to questionable content on social media and are less able to discern harmful content or protect their privacy. Council Rock worked with local legislators to arrange tonight's presentation by District Attorney Matthew Weintraub in hopes that an informed constituency will be better able to seek accurate, dependable information. Mr. Weintraub's presentation tonight will offer insight for social media users of all ages while highlighting what guardians can do to protect their children's privacy and personal information. When parents and guardians serve, serve as an extra layer of security for children who are active on social media, there is a greater likelihood that they will be aware and connect with care. We are grateful to Mr. Weintraub for taking the time to be here tonight on behalf of our community, and we are fortunate that he is visiting us while he is still district attorney. As you may already know, he will soon become the honorable Matthew Weintraub when he is sworn in as a common police court judge in Bucks County. Congratulations on your recent election, Mr. Weintraub. We in Council Rock understand that very often education extends beyond the walls of our school buildings. Our hope is that this program illuminates our community to the, re the reality of social media and sparks helpful conversations with your family and our children. And again, I would like to thank and welcome both Matt Weintraub and Dante Montella. Thank you for being with us. I'm going to lead this off, but we're going to jump in quickly. Uh, Dante is going to do the bulk of the presenting. He'll be play-by-play -play announcer, and I'll be the caller man. Uh, the, uh, the presentation is a ton of information. I don't want you to feel overwhelmed, so use the rule of one. If you get one good tidbit out of this presentation, that's a win. If you get one good website or reference to go to, that's a win for you. And I will tell you, a lot of what you're going to see is common sense, it's instinctual, but this will serve to reinforce that for you. I would also encourage you, in a, a little bit of irony, to have your camera phones ready, because some of the, th this uh, presentation will not be uh, reproduced, I do not believe, for you guys. So if you see a website on there, or a, a, a series of tips that you uh, particularly appreciate, take a picture. Grab it while you can. And uh, I think that we hope to get done inside of the hour. If we do have any time left between or with, within our hour and the, uh, the movie that you're going to see, which I did view, and it's, it is, uh, it's a few years old, but it's still pretty timely, then we will try to answer some questions. But we want to be mindful of your time. So with that, I'll turn it over to Detective Montella, and I'll add color where I can. Okay, uh, that's working. All right, good evening, and um, thank you so much. Thank you for the introductions. Um, we're gonna get right into a really, really important topic. And 
I'm not going to overstate this. There are so many pressures that our children are under in today's day and age, but none are as pervasive are as pervasive as what they are seeing and experiencing online. And I have been a police officer now for 27 years. I am a proud Council Rock graduate. Um, 27 years I've been doing this. But for the last four years, I've been working for this man at the district attorney's office. And my primary area of responsibility is child exploitation and online uh, predators. And when I tell you tonight, and I'm going to keep telling you tonight, that this is not the exception, but it is the rule, there are so many predators out there trying to gain your children's attention. And as parents, if you're not doing your due diligence, if you're not supervising your children online, you're opening them, opening them up for a tremendous amount of danger. So we're going to go over, I'll, let, me, let me back up. As uh, Matt said, I can't give you the slides today because this is content that we receive because we are part of the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force in Pennsylvania. And we're closely associated with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And they have this wonderful program called NetSmarts. And you can go online at any time, and I'm going to get you the website at some point during the presentation. And you can go and get some tools on how to speak to your children about the Internet in all different age groups. Because as we know, as kids grow, they start to, they don't want to listen to the parents anymore. Uh, but this will give you some tools to try to interact because, again, it's your responsibility. You need, to, you need to be speaking to your children about this before a predator begins to speak to them about it, and they will. So this evening, we're going to go over these topics. We are going to try to fly through this, and I don't want to shortchange you, but there's so much information about uh, safety on the Internet. But these are the basic topics we're going to go over. We're going to talk about vetting information online. Um, you know, it is, there's so much information, it's over, uh, information overload, and so we get ourselves all tied up in our daily lives, we have no idea what's true, what's fake, but can you imagine the undeveloped mind of a child trying to navigate this information? It's, it's really, really a scary thing. So we're going to talk about it generally, then we're going to talk about sort of how to identify fake social media accounts, and again, you're going to then go back home, and you're going to talk to your children about hopefully talk to them about how to spot these. While Dante's clicking the next slide, I just want to say this. This is, this is my belief. There's no such thing as a nosy parent. If, you, if your kids have social media, if they have phones, you have a right to access their social media and their phones. Now, keeping up with them is another story, but you should not worry that you're invading your child's privacy. That is your right as a parent, and frankly, it's being good parents. So, I think at this point in our lives, we all know uh, the dangers of something like a Wikipedia. Anytime we go on a search engine, we look for some type of topic. Usually within the first couple lines of the, the search, you're going to find some information on Wikipedia. And that's what we call an open source forum. So anybody could go on Wikipedia, and anybody could add or subtract information from that. And where we see that all the time is any time a celebrity is stricken with some illness, some keyboard warrior runs up and they want to be the first to present this on that Wikipedia page. And then inevitably, somebody then says, oh, this celebrity passed away. Without any fact checking, without any realization, without any, any news from anybody, not from the doctors, not from the publicists, but they want to be the first to put it on. And that information can come from anywhere. There's not one centralized information um, officer that puts this stuff out. And we sort of know that. If you've been to college in the last 10 years, every professor says Wikipedia is not a source because it's open source. But we kind of forget that social media is an open source. Everything that is on social media is user-generated content that doesn't necessarily have any truth associated. There's no validity to it. And I find, uh, you know, I, I, I remember one time I was, I was in my house and I, my clothes dryer broke. And uh, nowadays it seems like those are sort of disposable, but I didn't want to pay for a repairman. So one of my friends says, go on YouTube. You're going to find a video for anything on YouTube. So I did. But it got me thinking, what authority does this person teaching me how to fix my dryer have? Just because if I went online and I said, Dante Montella Maytag man, you're going to go and you're going to find my YouTube page, and you're going to say, well, this guy obviously knows what he's doing. 
Well, I just told you I've been a cop for 27 years, so I have no marketable skills out in the real world. I don't know how to fix a dryer, but just because I put the name on the bottom, people might listen to me. So the point is you have to vet your own information. You have to find the, the direct source. You have to go to maytag.com if you want to find some real true information. And in this case, we talk about, you know, Council Rock School District. We have, they have a website, crsd.org, right? And that's where the information that comes directly from the school district. Well, you may say, well, maybe I don't trust the information that comes from the school district. Well, I would ask you to vet the counter source that you find in the same way that you would vet the actual source. If you don't believe Council Rock School District or if you don't believe Maytag.com or our website at the district attorney's office. Which is always it, accurate, by the always way. Always accurate, yeah. But if you don't believe it, you're going to go find um, the, the uh, district attorney's antithesis page who is going to say we're doing everything wrong. Well, why would you believe them over us? Just use the same scrutiny and try to avoid the confirmation bias of going and finding the information that fits your narrative. And this is what our kids are doing as well. I don't know if you realize this, but if you go into your Facebook page right now, deep down in all the settings, go way, way down, they will actually mark what your political affiliation is based on the things that you've clicked on, based on the videos that you've watched. It's not content that you didn't go in and say that you're either Democrat, and Independent, or, or Republican. That's what they have labeled you. So every time you make a search, they're going to find that content to confirm your opinion. Because you want to know why? You're going to be on their platform longer, and they're going to be able to sell more advertising. So go to the sources, do your due diligence, and find out the information that you believe is true and correct. Now, this kind of parlays into our kids. Our kids have all these different social media sites, and they want to have friends. They want more and more and more friends, because that shows like some type of status. But they don't truly know who they're friendly with or who their friend groups are online. But they want more and more, so they're just going to keep friending and friending and friending. But as a parent, it is your responsibility to go onto their social media sites and review their friends list. If you do not recognize the name, you have to get them off the page. And we're going we're gonna to outline why that's important in a few minutes, because the predators know how to entice the children. They know what to say, they know what products our kids like, and they're going to try to exploit them. So if you go on a site, now this is just generically speaking, they have less than 10 or over 5,000 followers, there might be a little red flag. Does any of us know 5,000 people? Um, I don't know, maybe Matt does, but I'm not sure. You'll see generic posts, like there's no real content. They don't talk about their trip in the summer or their holiday vacation or, or any of these things that are sporting. It's just generic, maybe some memes are on there, but there's no general real content on there. And they may have an avatar or a profile picture that's just some, some cartoon or something because they don't really wanna go through the effort of trying to find a lot of pictures of the same person online. So in my world, I have to go on the internet a lot, so I, pr I created a fake account. And what did I do? I found some picture of a guy with a face mask on so you can't identify him and I put some things that are kind of around Bucks County some pictures just so it, like it shows that I'm from Bucks County and I started adding friends so I came across this young lady by the name of Lila Rivas and so you know they, they, you'll see here that there's a picture of a young woman she's inappropriately dressed to a degree um, you know it's sort of a, a, a provocative pose and you'll see there she has over 2,000 friends, but only one mutual friend. So you're telling me that we, there's 2,000 friends on her page, but we only know maybe one person the same. So every social media page, you always are going to have circles. You're going to have your Council Rock people. You're going to have your high school people, your college people, your athletic people, you know, athletics and music and, and all these other things. You're going to have these circles. Well, if you're not in any of these circles, that's probably a fake account. Wichita, Kansas. What are we doing as friends in Wichita, Kansas? Can I add something, Dante? Sure. Uh, I think a, a good way to remember this is safety over status. Your kids are going to seek status, and that's by number of clicks, number of friends, number of followers, number of likes. But that is inversely proportional to how safe they are. The fewer clicks, the fewer friends, the, fewer, the, the smaller their sphere, the more safe that they will be. So I take this one step further. 
And I, t I right clicked on her profile picture and I saved the picture on my desktop. And then I did a reverse Google photo search and I found, now you probably can't see this, it didn't turn out that well, but there are five different accounts on five different social media platforms with five completely different names with that same profile picture. So clearly this is just an individual or individuals that are trying to attract the attention of maybe a young man in this situation. So these are things that you can do. You can take a look at the friends list. You can see the circles that, the, that your friends are in and you can take a look at their profile picture and do a reverse search and see if it turns out anywhere. Just some ideas to try to keep us from falling, you know, falling victim to these fake profiles and then they're just going to continue to exploit our children. So our kids do a million things online. When I first started talking about internet safety, it was in 2000, I believe it was eight. My daughter was in, element, uh, was a, in kindergarten at the time. Um, I think that's right. But I used to say, put your computer in a location within your home that when you walk by, you're always going to see what's on their screen. But unfortunately, as we know today, that's impossible because there's a computer on everything. There's a computer on your kid's wrist. There's a computer in their pocket. There's a computer in their video games, and they have access to the Internet 24-7. So you have to figure out what they're doing online. You know, you got to realize they're blogging, they're vlogging, they're listening to people, they're talking to people in their video game. There's a million things that they're doing online. And if you're not monitoring it, then they're in danger. I also, I, I talk about this a lot. Like, we're about 30 minutes outside of Philadelphia right now, right? Philadelphia is an amazing place. A ton of culture. You could go see art. You could see music. You listen to music. You could go to sporting events. You see architecture. It's amazing. But I would venture to guess not a single person in this room would drive your child down to Philadelphia, open the door and say, hey, hon, I'll be back in about two hours. Enjoy yourself, but be careful. I don't think you're going to do that. And you have to treat the Internet like the city or another, or another place. You're always going to keep an eye on your child. There's dangers every turn. But there's also really great things at every turn. So you have to communicate with them. You have to supervise them. Technology is not going to do the job for you. And I don't mean this to demean anybody because I did the same thing. But when your child's cranky, sometimes you place a tablet in their hand so that they can start playing a game or watching a movie. But that's their introduction. That's their first step into the world of the Internet. And they start to gather, figure out how to maneuver the Internet and, and get onto the sites that they want to get onto. And there's just too much out there. Uh, just to, to go on top of that, uh, I, I think that communication is underrated. And I mean actually talking to our kids. Uh, we, we, we tend to not want to step on their toes. We know they're, gro they're grossly engaged in whatever activity they are doing online. But we need to pry them away from that. And frankly, the random checks are what work most effectively because they don't know when they're going to come. Uh, the kids, probably if they're savvy enough, they're going to give you their passwords because then they have their Finsta, their fake Instagram account. They're going to give you that one, and then they're going to have a second one. So you do need to be a little proactive. You don't have to monitor it 24 seven, it's impossible, but do those random checks and have that constant communication with your kids. So we talked, you know, all the dangers. This is sort of an outline of some of the things that we're seeing at different age groups. Um, you know, the younger children are facing some issues as well, but as they get older, I guess they say, you know, small kids, small problems, big kids, bigger problems, and it just keeps going and you start to see they're, 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 it just starts piling up all the issues that they can, they can experience. Uh, we'll talk about these more at length, so I'm going to keep moving on. But this is exactly what my boss was just talking about. You have to start the conversation when they're young. If you start talking about this as a kid, it's not going to be quite as uncomfortable the next time that you have to have the uncomfortable conversation. You know, when, when, when things are good, when things are calm, when you're not fighting with your child, maybe when you're driving to and from after school activities, start to engage them in conversations because, as you know, I don't have to tell you this, but children love to talk about the things that you may not know about. They love to like, kind of teach you a little bit. So in the nice calm moments, start asking them what social media sites they're on. Start asking them some of the things that they've experienced on these social media sites when things are good because when things get bad, You've already broken the ice. You already kind of have an understanding of the vocabulary. You know, we, as the adults in the room, we're not digital natives. We did not grow up with this stuff. 
most of the challenges that our kids face, we can kind of go with the flow because we remember what our parents did to teach us or what our, our guardians did. But that didn't happen when we were kids. So we're so new to this. So have them teach you as well. Ask them questions. They love it. I used to do that with my daughter all the time. When things were chill, I'd say, hey, tell me a little bit about this website. And she would tell me. And then I would get like this knowledge. So I'd probably want to keep her off of that website from now on. So be supportive. Start to, start to develop the problem-solving skills at an early age. Teach them how to navigate it themselves at first if they can. And if they can't, then come to a trusted adult. So inappropriate context content. What I do for a living, folks, every, almost every day, the Bucks County District Attorney's Office gets another cyber tip line report about content that is occurring online in Bucks County. And it's not a lower end of the county or a central part or an upper end of the county thing. It is an entire county thing. I think last year, my unit, which is myself and another detective, we investigated over 200 cyber tip line reports. Each one of those reports have the potential of another child victim because there's tons of pornography out there. There's tons of violent speech, hate speech, risky behavior. You want to learn about something bad, you go online, and our kids can find it. They find it much easier than we can find it. You know, you go on a pornography site, there's this little box that says, are you 18? Click yes. You don't have to verify anything. You click yes. And they can go on it. So if you're not watching what they're doing, I guarantee you they're at least trying to see what's out there. Um, and our job as the parents just need to be trusted. You have to listen to them, be willing to help, don't overreact, because I know I, I'm an Italian guy, I used to overreact, but you can't do that. You want them to feel respected and feel heard. I think there's a couple of great buzzwords on here, some touchstones here. To be kind, don't overreact, as Dante said, uh, and listen without judgment or shame. If, if we're truly going to have an impact on our kids' uh, social media platforms and their usage, we have to do so judgment-free, especially if they're heading in the wrong direction. It's very difficult. I'm a parent, too. Uh, it's very difficult to practice what I preach. But if you can do that, you will forge those bonds of trust with your kids when it comes to social media. So I think this might be a good slide to maybe take it take a picture of if, if you're interested because even when you know again when things are tough and when your your you know your aggravation level is up here you want to remember what do we what do we need to do um, and, and it's just again don't frighten the kids it's not the end of the world we're gonna work through it um, the, the ramifications of messing up online unfortunately sometimes can last for forever but we have to take a deep breath tell them it's not their fault it's a normal process of growing up things that they're doing online, answer their questions, and then help them report it. And we'll talk to you a little bit about reporting this in a minute and, and some of the laws that surround some of the things that happen. This next slide is going to be what they should do. So uh, I often have that question, well, what happens when they are approached or there is content that they don't like? They need to turn it off immediately. They just need to get out of there. They say use the back button so you, you get out of that page right away. They need to tell their, their trusted adult. Um, they're often, you know, anytime you buy uh, hardware or software for your computer or you go onto a new website, they always have these, they call them EULAs, the, uh, the, you know, the instructions on how to use their product. And they always have all these violations. And so I tell parents, if you see something on one of these social media sites or, or you know, any other platform, go back to the user agreements and find out how this user is violating them because they all have lawyers, they all have very good lawyers, and the lawyers wrote those agreements. And if you can show that the individual is in violation of those agreements, they will tend to take down the content very quickly. Dante, I just want to add something that's probably going to come up later in the presentation. But uh, a, a lot of what you're going to see is, is comes under the auspices of cyberbullying, where one or usually it's a pile-on situation is going to gang up on your child. And the one thing that I, well, a couple things I tell people, never engage, never take the bait, never take from a stranger, never take the bait from a cyber bully. And what I'd like you to do is to take a screenshot instead. That way, if it's on uh, Snapchat, for instance, or something that can be erased or ghosted, you're going to preserve that. And we do like you to report it. 
I know you think, well, do I have to report every little thing? But this little thing today may morph into a larger thing if it's not squashed down the road. So when in doubt, report it. Uh, take that snapshot, don't engage, and report it. And to, to Matt's point, uh, from a law enforcement perspective, not every time you walk in a police station and report something is it going to end in, a, in an arrest. We have so many amazing resources in Bucks County. We have an organization called NOVO, the Network of Victim Assistance. We have all these great resources to help your kids if they find themselves in a bad spot. So if you come to the police station, it doesn't always necessarily have to be a law enforcement action at the end. It is just a referral to kind of get you help. Um, we are some trusted adults as well that can kind of guide you in the right direction. Sometimes it will end in an arrest. If it's a violation of the law and we think we can prove it, it's, we're, you know, we go after predators, we go after cyber bullies. Um, but, you know, it doesn't always end in an arrest. So the final thing here is report it to the cybertipline.org. Um, that's a website. Uh, again, that's run through the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. They are our clearinghouse in the United States for all tips that go online. All, all, all tips that are generated from online electronic service providers. So as you can imagine, you know, the World Wide Web is worldwide, so we can only deal with what's happening in the United States, but a lot of this content is generated from outside of the United States and comes in while well, they're the clearinghouse and they, they will get it to the right police department. So together, we talked about teaching our kids we can go through privacy settings and teach them how to block these users, and we can then report it to the local law enforcement and um, the National Center. So inappropriate content, I mean, we all know what it is. I mean, you, you can go online and buy drugs. You can go online and find out where an underage drinking party is. Um, this is what we're talking about. It's not just the predators that we're having problems with. Like, there's literally all these pages devoted to, hey, this is where the party's gonna be. Bring your car, bring your hot rod to this location. This is all going on online. So these, this is the inappropriate context that we're also talking about. Online privacy, talk about it. Again, what is okay to share? You know, we talk about this all the time and, and it goes falls on deaf ears and, and I'm, I'm guilty too. But if you put a picture of your child in Council Rock graduation, or you know, uh, Council Rock uh, Holland Elementary School, or whatever it's called now, they're go the predators that are looking are going to know that that's where your kid lives. If they're in Council Rock Little League baseball, they're going to know that that's what they like. So, uh, as much as we want to share this information <coughs> with our loved ones, it goes back to if we don't know all of our friends on the friends list, they're going to have access to all this. So we have to teach our kids not to put this personal information out. Uh, to, uh, I'm going to share a revelation with you. My, my wife and I, we have two kids. They're grown. They're adults now. We never posted them online, our kids, not once ever. Uh, it took a lot of discipline. It was the rule that was set, and then we had to discourage our family from doing the same because they wanted to post those family portraits, those group gatherings. We had a hard and fast rule. We wanted to be, okay, we'll be the bad guys. But we were able to protect our kids at least in that regard. Now, when it came time to our kids posting, <laughs> it was a little different story, but we at least set that precedent. I think it's a great rule to follow, at least to start. And then that goes right back, snap maps. I don't know if you guys know what snap maps are, but our kids literally know where all their friends are at all times. That information is being constantly, constantly broadcast. I mean, it's, I looked at my daughter's snap maps one time, and you know, in the summertime, you could see all of her friends migrate to the Jersey Shore. And in the wintertime, they all migrate up to the mountains to go skiing. And, and I could follow each and every one of them and everywhere they've gone. Can you imagine that in the hands of a predator? So you may not think you're sharing your information of where you are, but you absolutely are. The pictures that you take, these photographs, they all have metadata on it. I mean, sometimes there's GPS locations on where those photographs are taken. In the wrong hands, that could be very damaging information if somebody wants to get at your child. And I'm, I, I know I'm scaring you, and, and I know I'm saying all the worst case scenarios, but that's what we need to do. We have to have these serious conversations because just yesterday we made an arrest of a child predator, um, and it's happening so, with so much more frequency. You know, videos, our kids, they can't do anything, 
anything today without videotaping themselves, TikToking, whatever they're doing. <coughs> it's, I walk down the halls and the kids have everything filming themselves. That's all they do is broadcast themselves and it's not healthy. If you wanna share it amongst your friends, I guess it's fine, but when you're sharing with the world and that's what you're doing when you put it online, it, it could be damaging. I've had cyber tip line reports where I have children who cannot speak yet. They're toddlers. They're filming themselves doing some pretty inappropriate, well, not inappropriate, but going to the bathroom. Because they see their parents filming themselves doing everything. They see their older siblings filming themselves doing everything, so they think it's normal. I've been in more houses speaking to caregivers saying that your toddler just broadcast an uh, inappropriate video on YouTube. And they were shocked. It's happening. Personal information, obviously we don't give passwords out, home address, location, cell phone numbers, emails. This seems to be common sense, but again, if you're falling, you know, you kind of get ease into a, a, a comfortable environment. You think I could share this stuff with my friends and then it gets out there and it's never coming back. And when you share it, you're gonna be online scams. I mean, how many of them go, does our office see? I mean, there are so many online scams. Identity theft is something that is outrageously rampant. I just want to add one to this uh, because, sadly, this is what we encounter a lot in, a, in the juvenile world. When you'll see cyberbullying, and it's just like if you watch an NFL game, the, the first guy gets away with the, the punch or the shove, and then the second guy, that's when the refs are paying attention, he, gets, he shoves back, and this guy goes, oh, oh, and it's the second guy that gets the penalty. Well, that's what often happens with cyberbullying. The victim is truly cyberbullied, but then the victim is feeling helpless and powerless, and then they retaliate. And when they retaliate, often they make a threat, and they say, I'm going to shoot you, I'm going to kill you, I'm going to bring a gun to school, et cetera, et cetera. And that is DEFCON 1, ladies and gentlemen. When it goes to that level, we can't put that genie back in the bottle. We then get involved and we are investigating and oftentimes, although it's not fatal to your, your child, but it results in a, a, a juvenile disposition in the juvenile justice system. So we wanna try to curtail it before it gets that far. So starting today, establish the rules, establish the guidelines. What can you share, what can't you share? If they violate your, your rules, then you have to be prepared to take the devices away from them. You have to be prepared to shut off the internet access. Um, there, if there are no consequences, then you're not gonna stop it. So today, you establish your rules, what you can share. There's not gonna be any excuse then when they do and the, your devices are taken away. Um, learn how to report it. Uh, I think after today, you'll learn, you tell your local police, or you could go to the National Center and, and you can report it there. Help them with the privacy settings on their phone. So again, I told you about the metadata and the photographs. You could go in and turn all that off. When you're sitting around in your quiet time, Google it, learn how to do it, learn how the safety features of each one of your children's in, um, specific devices that they have, and make it your business and learn the privacy settings. Ironically, they can Google it and watch a YouTube video on how to do it, right, right Dante? And it may not be accurate, but you could give it a try. Um, you know, we set, when my daughter was young, at a specific time on the Apple iPhone, you could shut off their access. You don't have to do it every night. It just automatically will shut off. To this day, my daughter's in college and her, her internet shuts off at 10 o'clock. She's not happy, but I don't know how to change it back, so we're not there. Um, <laughs> talk again now about the friends list. You know, we now know why it's important to, to keep an eye on that and create a plan for when things go wrong. Because um, these are the worst case scenarios, the online enticement. Once this person gets into your child's life, they're gonna use everything in their power to ingratiate themselves they're gonna to try to make them look so desirable. They're gonna bad mouth your parents. Your parents don't understand you. They don't care about you. I care about you. And they're going to start, they're gonna say, hey, you like baseball? I love baseball. And they're going to continue this, and they're so good at what they do. And I've seen it firsthand. I, wa I, I have opportunities to read the messages back and forth from predator to child, and I can't believe how easy it is to get them up. Can I touch on this, Dante? Uh, so sex, sex extortion is something that we're seeing. It's very prevalent nowadays. And what we're seeing more and more of, maybe even the majority of, is a sexual predator or, or frankly, a, uh, 
a person that just wants to, to steal money is going to entice your, your, the young men in your house, the, the teenage boys in your house, and catfish them, which means they're going to pose as a young woman usually, and entice the young man to send naked pictures of himself to this, to this predator. And then the predator will extort that young man and say, if you don't get me money, if you don't send me or buy gift cards or whatever it is, I'm going to then send this picture to your contacts, or I'm going to post it on our link to your social media or whatever. And this is what we're seeing more and more and more of, unfortunately. Yeah, because, you know, let's not forget, for a couple of years, our kids couldn't even leave their house. They were stuck in their house, and they, they lost this uh, a couple years of socialization skills, and so they, they started learning how to forge relationships online. And those relationships, don't, they don't just stop at friendships. They're starting to forge their own sexual identities online. And so when they find this person that connects with them, they may be willing to do things on video that you would never think they would. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a couple more slides, but, um, but it's, you know, it's, it's very prevalent. I mean, we are seeing a huge increase in those type of crimes. So... You know, they, they use every social media site. Inevitably, when I speak about uh, social media at the end, somebody says, hey, can you give us a couple ideas of some sites that they should stay away from or they should go on? I, I really am not going to do that because every site has a benefit and every site has a negative side of it. I'm not going to badmouth one or praise another because there's good and bad in all of them. Um, but that's where they live, on the social media sites. And they, they hop from platform to platform. If they're on the Xbox and they're talking to their buddies, they say, hey, why don't we snap? What's your snap? And then they'll cross over to the snap platform. And then they'll go from platform to platform. And they do that for a reason. That way, if the parents are actually watching it, what's going on in Xbox, then they may not realize that the switch has been made and they think they just got coffee. We we're seeing this more with older teens, um, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter the age. Um, and there's a lot of solicitation happens by peers. Like, we start to investigate some crimes where, you know, there's, there's people in your own school that they just want to they wanna try to exploit you. They want to try to get some dirt on you. They want to they wanna bully you, and, th and they'll be the, the I want to touch on that, too, Dante. What, what, what we see a lot of times is you'll get an uh, eighth-grade boy and girl, and they're in love. And so one or the other and not the stereotype, but often it's the, the young man will entice the young lady to send naked pictures of her to him. And then what, if, what inevitably happens? Eighth graders don't stay in love forever. They break up. And then the person that just received the pictures then disseminates the pictures to his whole uh, contact list. And that's, the, the damage was already partly done, but that's when the damage really uh, magnifies. And then we have to clean up the mess. When I first started doing this work, if a child, or anybody under the age of 18, shared an intimate image of another child, it was a felony, which could potentially, or am I wrong, it could have been like a Megan's Law, a sex offender thing? So uh, the legislature has kind of dumbed that down a little bit over the years. And so, and, and under the, the leadership of, of, of Mr. Weintraub, we, we kind of, like, if, if you share it with maybe your, your significant other, we're not going to be vigorously prosecuting that, but the minute that that person then spreads it elsewhere, that's the people that we're going after. Those are the people that continue to spread it. And um, you see this last line here, most were not bothered by it. I sat in a room with a young lady, and this was a few years ago, who had shared images of herself to some peers. And I said to the young lady, I said, you know, I understand that you think it's okay to share that with your peer, but what if it came up into my hands as an older man? At the time I was in my 40s. What if, what if I, a person like me, had it? She goes, I don't care. Like, it's almost like this generation has sort of is, is desensitized to showing their bodies. And, and in some aspects, it's good. There's disempowerment. They're not embarrassed by it. But they almost are just inclined to just share it. And I'm not saying that's everybody, but I see that a lot. They just don't care. They just, uh, whatever, we'll, we'll deal with it. So grooming, this is what they do. They exploit the curiosity of a child. Their kids want to find things. They want to talk to people. They want to explore. Um, 
and they start talking. And then, and like I said to you before, they start talking about commonalities. They start saying, hey, I like this, you like this. Then, as it starts to get worse, then they say, hey, I'm gonna send you a picture. Have you ever seen anything like this before? And it's shocking to the child for the first time. But after the fifth time that the person sends it, they start to get desensitized to it. And so then they may be more inclined to send a photo back, and that's what the, the groomer is looking for. If it gets really out of hand, they start to send gift cards. Hey, I'm gonna send you a gift card. Don't tell your mom, but you can buy whatever you want. And I'm gonna send you lingerie in the mail. I want you to put it on and I want you to wear it. These are all real life examples. This is not fantasy world. These are things that we have seen in real life in Bucks County. So if you start to see, you know, they're flattering, they're discussing sex and dating, ask them to keep a secret. If your child is keeping a secret of somebody that they met online from you, um, there is a real, real problem. And Dante, to make a point here, so how would you know these things? The only way to know them is to look at your child's profile, to look at your child's text material, to look at your child's different platform identities. It's the only way to know these things. So you gotta be super involved and do those spot checks. You know, the kids calling numbers, you have, you have access to a call log, you don't recognize the numbers. If when you walk in, they like minimize the screen real quick and they look guilty. Um, if they start rejecting family, where we start to see it getting real ingrained, when, when the grooming is really deep, the child will start to, they'll start to isolate themselves because you know what? It's me and my new paramour against my family. And I'm not gonna share any of this information with my family because they're not gonna understand that I'm dating an older man. And it starts to get really bad and they're getting upset when they're online. What used to cause them pleasure, what used to give them pleasure on being online, chatting with friends is now an ugly thing. It's a secretive thing. You'll start to notice the personality change. You know them better than anybody. If you start to see personality change associated with their electronic device, that's, a, that's when you start to, you really need to start delving into it. You need to start talking to them about what a healthy relationship is. You know, I don't know if we even think about telling our teenage children that it's not appropriate to date 25 year olds because we're not even thinking that's a possibility. But when you set those parameters, that is not normal, that is not right, and it's not legal. Talk about it, set the policy about meeting offline. Never, ever, ever meet somebody because you're buddies. You know, oh, my buddy from Kansas is in town, we met online, we met on Xbox. That has got to be a no-go. Know your children's online friends. We talked about that. Find the list, go through them, ask them who's this, who's this, who's this. Get to know them. Teach them the warning signs that we just went over, like the grooming. Like You, you need to teach your ch children what grooming means. They need to hear that from you for the first time. And then call the police and report it to the cyber tip line. Again, the police can get you resources, can get you help. <coughs> this slide, I actually almost took it out. I was talking to Matt, I'm like, I don't really understand this slide. I don't think I'm gonna keep it in. But then I looked at it, I'm like, you know what? Sometimes kids are even smarter than we are. And the sometimes kids are even more blunt than we are. We are always so politically correct, I don't wanna offend anybody. Every once in a while, a kid will just be like, yo, you're gross. Don't send me that. And teach your kids, empower them. If somebody sends them a naked photograph, that's disgusting. Delete it and move on. And that, that's sort of like an idea here. You're gross, move on. So this is the National Center if you wanna take a photograph. Um, this is the clearing house. We get, like I said, 200 complaints a year about from the cyber tip line. It's a great resource, it's a great organization. Um, you know, I've been to multiple trainings with, with the staff. I mean, these people are, are saints in this organization. So if you ever need anything, don't be afraid to reach out to them as well. So we're, we're moving on, you know, 15 minutes sexting. Um, we all know what that is. I like this slide because this looks like sort of updated statistics. Almost 20% of the teens have actually engaged in sexting. And then 30, almost 35% of the teens say they've received this sex. So uh, what's sexting? Nude images that are being texted back and forth. So these are pretty, pretty high numbers, and we are seeing this at lower, lower ages. 
I remember a story where, if you remember the show Dance Moms, I think it's back again or something, but um, Dance Moms was on and there was a, a, a little girl, eight years old, and the guy was on these, these chat groups and she was eight and she voluntarily sent herself, she sent her new photographs out at eight. So it's not, it's not just a teen thing. I, don't, I won't talk about this ad nauseum because we all know what it is. Um, sometimes people do it to be funny. You know, I want to impress, I want to fit in. To impress the crush, that's always the thing. Oh, I'm going to take a picture because I just want to show, you know, I, I want to show who I am. And peer pressure, same things we've always dealt with at, at school age children. And again, experimenting with relationships, sexual behavior. Uh, kids are online all the time. They always, you know, kids from the beginning of time will experiment with different sexual things. But now it's, it's like memorialized online. And I want to talk, talk about peer pressure for a second. I, I remember growing up, uh, peer pressure was, was still horrible. But it was only generally when you were with your peers or your peers had access to you. Think about that now. It's 24-7 if your kids have that device and they have access to that device. And the pressure is excruciatingly intense because it's not just one person putting the pressure on. It's every follower, every person that's in this pile on, unfortunately. So take the pressure that we used to feel and you force multiply that. That's what our kids are dealing with. It's incredibly compelling and difficult to resist and we have to harden them. And frankly, if they succumb to the peer pressure, we gotta make sure they know it's not the end of the world. It's okay, don't feel ashamed. Let's pick ourselves up, dust ourselves off, and move on. And that's that resilience that we want you guys to reinforce with your kids. Just a quick list of some of the consequences of, of sexting. Um, there's probably a ton more, uh, but it can affect a lot of different aspects of the child's life, leading all the way up into police involvement. We'll talk to you about uh, the criminality of it. So again, start the conversation early. If you notice a trend here, we gotta talk. Um, real life examples, you know, I'm sure your friends and, and, and family and close uh, relationships, you've heard stories, tell your kids about it, uh, let them know it's real, let them know that you're there to support them if it happens. And, and t t to use a very, very real life example, you all are here watching this, either at home or you're, you're here, use this as the stepping off point to have that conversation with your kids. You say you heard from a couple people from the district attorney's office, said let's have the conversation. This is your excuse to start. So sextortion, um, you know, Matt already talked about this. It, it, it is a growing problem. Um, more and more children are getting themselves caught up in this, this process. Um, and, you know, there are a couple. <coughs> So, you know, you get the point of that. Um, do not comply with the demands. The, in the investigations that I've conducted on these, the individuals have driven up to Rite Aid or whatever, and they've gotten the gift cards, and they s scratch off the back, they send the numbers to the, to the offender, and then 20 minutes later, they're like, ooh, I got another video, and I need another set of, uh, set of gift cards. So it just is a cycle, you know, these are, not good people, they're not just because you give them a little bit of money, they're not gonna go away. And here's a way to reassure your kids, because they are the targets. Think about these people that are out there that are doing this uh, to, for a living, it's pretty cruel. They're putting like 500, 1,000 fishing lines into that water, they only gotta catch one fish. So if your child is resistant in any way to these over, overtures, the fisherman moves on to the next potential fish. So it's never too late to resist, to show any kind of resistance. But once they're on the hook, once your child's on the hook, that, that fisherman is just going to keep hitting them up for additional, additional uh, extortional demands.
and that's what we want to prevent. We talk about reporting it to the app. That's usually a very quick and easy thing to do. The apps make it very easy for like there's an appropriate contact to report it. Um, don't delete the account because if we do need to do an investigation, there are all sorts of, sorts of ways that we could um, interrogate their device basically where we can get IP addresses and we can, there are a lot of investigative leads. Unfortunately, most of these cases lead us overseas and we haven't been very successful in prosecutions, but once in a while we can find some information and, and, and make arrests. So don't delete things, just go to the police and we'll start working on the case for you. Um, this, I, this, this other uh, website here, um, if you have a chance to take a picture, I actually just went on this today. Um, it's actually a really neat resource. You know, once you put an image out on the internet, there's really no taking it back. There's no way that we can, uh, we can't call a centralized number and say, hey, uh, remove this image from your internet. Um, it's just impossible. And most of these social media companies, they don't really like law enforcement very much. So they, they don't go out of their way to help us. So this gives you some tips on how to try. They will do this thing where they try to erase it from the internet. Each photograph that you take, remember I told you about the metadata? Well, there's something called a hash value on that photograph that's unique to that digital photograph for the, the, the life of that photo. So if I take a picture of the crowd right now and I send it to you, that same hash value is gonna be associated with that picture. So once we identify the hash of these illegal, illegal uh, videos and photographs, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children can put the net out and try to locate them. It's not 100%, but it's something that they could do. So, great resource. Uh, we've already talked about bullying and cyberbullying. Uh, I'm gonna really pop through this really quickly. Uh, again, this is where the creating fake profiles comes in. You know, they'll come in and they'll start bullying, they'll, they'll post videos. Um, this is really the bread and butter of, you know, this is what's happening almost every day. In, in your schools and in your, in your communities. It's the cyber harassment, the cyber bullying. Um, you know, it spreads fast, it follows them everywhere they go. Um, a couple years ago, the uh, Pennsylvania legislature actually made a rule or made a law called cyber harassment of, of a child. Um, do you wanna say anything about it or just touch on it? It, it? We used to not be able to prosecute this, or we would only be able to prosecute it as a summary offense. Uh, we very recently did a case uh, with, with a lady that was, because she felt that her daughter was being bullied, she then began to effectively spread rumors and innuendo and bullying the, the three young ladies that she thought uh, were bullying her daughter, and she got charged with this cyber harassment and went to trial and got convicted. So. The law has now withstood the test, and it's a good weapon in our arsenal to help keep your kids safe from this type of bullying. And, and just one other point on that, you know, if your child is, you know, in, in a you know, marginalized community or you know, LGBTQ plus and, and, and all these different um, you know, physical characteristics, may, you know, if they're being teased based on any of that, it makes this a little bit harsher. So the laws are finally catching up and trying to protect you know, our children and the marginalized communities as well. So um, it creates all of that. In worst case scenario, there's definitely a lot of stories where it, it could lead to suicide because it seems so um, insurmountable. But there's ways around it and, and as parents, you can continue to support your kids. Um, if you see them stop using their cell phone, I told you about that earlier, that's a red flag because you know how much they love their phones. They, they seem uneasy about going to school, they withdraw, you know, again, all of these signs that we, maybe we once thought, oh, is our kid on drugs? Like, that's what we might have thought in the past. Well, the reality is, is that they might be having a lot of problems online. Um, I think this is worth noting. We talk about this a lot with NOVA, that network of victim assistance. There are the cyber bullies, they're the ones who are doing it, then there's the victims. Then there's bystanders, and your kids, we've got to teach them to be upstanders. They have got to stop sitting around. If they see that there's bullying that's going on, they have a, res a responsibility as a human being to stand up and tell the bullying to stop. Don't continue to spread it. If you teach your kids those things, 
it makes it a lot easier for the victims here. So be an upstander. Don't just stand by while all this bullying is going on. It takes a lot of courage, but it's very empowering for your child to be an upstander. So one thing I want to point out here, set up new accounts. Th that is so much easier said than done because our kids' identities are wrapped up in these social media accounts. And so if you try to shut them down and start them up again, you're going to get a lot of resistance. But sometimes that's the only way to, to put this bullying behind you. Um, you can read that. That's the bullying behaviors, using computers at all hours. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty self-explanatory. Multiple accounts. Um, what Matt said about Finsta, you know, every, most kids have the accounts that the parents know of and then they have the accounts that the parents don't know about, and that's where the bullying is taking place. Monitor them online, monitor their offline behavior. Again, establishing expectations. Here is the, we're, I think we're almost done here, but be a model of good behavior. Too many times the adults are getting wrapped up in this cyberbullying as well. They're keyboard warriors. It's, um, it's called disassociation. It's so much easier to say something really nasty to somebody when they're on the other side of the computer. But if I walked up to Matt, who's probably like six foot four or something, and I'm going to say something to his face, I'm probably not going to li like the results. So it's a lot easier for me to make fun of Matt online because he's never going to get to me. So as parents, I mean, all you have to do is just read the comments in the, the Courier Times. People are nasty to one another, nasty. Your kids see that. Your kids see the way you talk to other people. Be the good model. Model the good line behavior online and offline. The upstander, that's, we talked about that. Text options real quick. Um, there are a lot of options. There are programs out there. We do not recommend any specific one, but learn your own devices. Google what you think would be the best for your, your world, but there are ways to monitor what the kids are doing online. And uh, I know we only have probably about three minutes left, Dante, but the, the devices, the protective devices, are still no substitute for being a parent and having these conversations and frankly being nosy about what your kid's doing online and into it. No, no machine or, or, uh, or program is going to substitute for that. that that's NetSmart's kids.org, again, a great resource for activities, books, games, videos. A lot of it is geared towards younger kids, but that's where we need to start because as they get older, sometimes it's too late. So uh, we really want to thank you. You I, did it. I, I know. Right? This is great. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I put my email address up there, and, I, and I, I mean this from the bottom of my heart. If you need anything whatsoever um, and, and you have a question, you can email me any time of the day or night. I have a huge passion for this. And I want to help out. I want to give you advice and ideas. I'm not the end-all, be-all. I'm not an expert. But I've been doing it long enough where I've seen so many families just broken by online activity. And I'm not exaggerating. Just broken by this. So if I can help you in any way, direct you in any way, please feel free to email me and I'll get back to you. I promise. All right. Thank you all for your attention. Enjoy the movie. Thank you, Detective Montella and District Attorney Weintraub. We appreciate you being here to help us and help our community, and most importantly, help our students. Um, we're going to take a few minute break right now so that our 